for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you. Sunday morning, May the 27th, 1990. Memorial Weekend Teaching and Deliverance Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Linda Sutter is the minister of the morning. And, uh, but, you know, I, sometimes I call her Reverend Sister Sutter. Are you going to sing? She's going to sing. How many love to hear her sing? All, of the, all those tapes are back there. She knows hundreds of court. Clap for Jesus. Clap for Jesus, not for her. The Jesus in her. All those tapes back there, you need to get some of them and take them back. They are so wonderful. Hallelujah. And I feel like we need to minister to him a little more. What was that song we sang just a few minutes ago? Uh, you brethren, Jesus be the Lord of all. I want us to sing it again. Jesus be the Lord of all. Jesus be the Lord of all. Jesus
Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Just minister to him a moment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. be obedient to the Spirit. I feel the anointing of the Lord here to minister. And let's just minister to the Lord. I mean, minister, you know, by the Spirit. Let's just wait on the Lord a little bit and uh, see how He leads here. Minister to Him. Hallelujah. Glory to Your name. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Gloria, Sada Maharanda. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory to the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, be. that will be holy to Him. We've heard at every service that He wants us to be holy to Him. He's doing a work of righteousness and holiness in us and that we need to submit to Him and uh, let that begin to come forth in our lives. Now I'm aware that many of us, many of you here, are going to go back to situations that are less than perfect. And this morning, we'll just see how the Lord leads here. But... uh, I want to encourage you uh, as you go back to your homes to go with what you've received here and let it begin to take root and to grow in the places where God has established you. Amen. And as we were worshiping the Lord this morning and and, uh, Doc saw the glory cloud, I didn't see it, but I felt it. Felt the anointing uh, moving on us and and I I was aware of... uh, Many of you uh, in situations where you feel like you're standing alone 
and you feel like you don't have anybody that shares the vision, anybody that shares the things that God uh, has put within your heart. And we want to fan that this morning that God has put within you. And I especially want to pray for you this morning because God showed me that in the place where you are, that you felt like you've been standing very much alone. And that you felt that uh, uh, you have have stood and and uh, there's no one around you. But I feel like God showed me that there are a number of people around you, and that as you allow that word of righteousness uh, to come forth from your lips and uh, where you dwell, that God shall add to that which He's begun in the place where you are. I don't know where you're from, don't know what town you live in, but God is saying you did not abide alone there, that there are others who are crying out for that which your heart is crying out for. And so we release the purposes of God in you, and we release it in your town. We release it where you are. Hallelujah. That there will be those that will come and find refuge and find comfort for their for their souls in the place where our sister is in the name of Jesus hallelujah praise the lord praise the lord hallelujah 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 praise the lord hallelujah hallelujah let's lift our hands and rejoice in him this morning glory glory hallelujah 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah, glory, 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 hallelujah, 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 bless the Lord, bless the Lord. I want to pray for you, yes, hallelujah, we minister to our brother, we call forth the gift of God in him, this we, uh, we thank you Lord that you've established him in yourself. And that, Lord, for him as well, uh, there have been times when he feels that he has stood alone in the place where he is. And we pray, God, that the weeks ahead will be seasons of refreshing for him. We pray that it will be a time of visitation. Even that which you've done within this place in the last couple days, as he goes uh, to his own home, that it will be a time of visitation uh, by your spirit. And I believe that God is showing me, brother, that he's going to begin to unfold the scriptures to you. He's going to begin to cause understanding to flow. Uh, that you cried out and you've asked the Lord for. And there's times you felt you wish somebody was right there to explain it to you. And God is saying the Holy Ghost will teach you those things. He is in the midst of thee. He shall begin to cause the revelation to grow and the word to take on new meaning. And I see that the scriptures becoming alive. I see them leaping off the pages. And I see them becoming a revelation to you as you eat of them. And as you uh, 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 mull over them. And it shall not just be words and ink any longer. But the revelation of God and power uh, by the Holy Spirit has come to you this day, has already been uh, uh, within and has been in a, in a place of growth. And we release it right now in the midst of our brother. And we believe you'll give him that place to begin to share the revelation that you've put within the deeps of his spirit. Hallelujah. 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 For the Lord has prepared and has been doing a place of preparation. Uh, in you, my brother. And there have been times when uh, you've stood and you've wondered, Lord, when can I go? When can I go? And the Lord is saying that as you are trained by Him and as you have stood and been harnessed by the Lord, that He shall lead thee out and He shall lead thee into places uh, where you shall declare that which He has done within you as you have stood in that place of preparation. Oh, think it not that it has been time ill spent and think it I think not that the Lord has uh, uh, forgotten or that his timetable uh, is off. Uh, the Lord's timetable has been perfect and he shall cause your feet to go to and fro into some other places and to declare that which he has done uh, within your own fellowship, within your own place. And I, I believe the Lord is showing me that there is going to come uh, not only a release in ministering the word, but there's coming a release in the gifts of the Spirit. And we call it forth in our brother in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, glory to your name. Hallelujah. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, bright and true. Make me a living sanctuary for you. I'll sing it again to the Lord. Lord, prepare me, hallelujah, to be a sanctuary, pure and holy. Right and true, and with thanksgiving, make me a living sanctuary for you. We release the gift of God within our sister. For, Lord, you're showing me that she has been in a place where there has been darkness around her and witchcraft powers have been around her and have even wanted to kill the gift of God within. But we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you're greater than the powers of darkness. You're greater than the powers that dwell among us. And we release the gift of God within our sisters to speak forth the word of the Lord in her household and in her uh, area, and that God, the word of the Lord, shall change the circumstances. In the name of Jesus, for you've cried to the Lord, and at times you've despaired of strength, and God is saying He shall cause strength to rise up out of you. He shall cause uh, His strength uh, to uh, uh, radiate forth from you. And in that hour when you felt that you could not stand, and in that hour when you wondered how much more you could endure, the Lord is saying uh, that He was strong in your behalf at that time and in days to come, uh, though there would be times that there would be things that would continue to come against you and to try you and to try your faith, God God is saying that he is going to keep you in the hour of trial. He is going to keep you in the hour of temptation. He's going to keep you when the fire would come near thee. But he shall not allow thee to be burned. He shall not cause the waters to overflow thee. But he shall cause thee to come forth in victory. And God is going to give you a song of victory in the midst of the fire. And God is going to cause a song of victory to come up out of you and to set the captive free for the preparation that has been going on within thee has been a, a, a preparation to bring deliverance in the body of Christ. And we just release our sister into your purposes and into your will this very moment. Hallelujah. 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 Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Oh, we praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, prepare me. Amen. To be a sanctuary, hallelujah, pure and holy, bright and true, and with thanksgiving, make me a living sanctuary. be a sanctuary. That's what he's doing. Amen. Pure and holy. Amen. Tried and true. And with thanksgiving. Oh, amen. Make me a
Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. The anointing is here to minister to Him. Amen. Minister to Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory to the Lord. Glory, glory, glory to the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Oh, sweet wonder. presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Brother Rod, God showed me a picture of you this morning with your feet growing about ten sizes. And I felt like the Lord was saying he was causing your territory to increase and he was causing your authority to grow. And we thank you, Lord, for that in our brother Rod. We thank you for that ministry in him. We thank you, Lord, for that word which dwells richly and which dwells deeply in him. And we believe, Lord, you're prepared and there are people that are waiting and have been praying. And that, God, you're going to send him in some places where others haven't gone. You're going to send him into some places uh, where people have been crying to hear the word of the Lord. And, God, we thank you that you're releasing our brother uh, into those places where they've been crying out for, for fresh water water and for oil from the throne of God. We thank you for that and that God you're going to use him to show people the the, uh, deeper things of God and you're going to use him to show them uh, the and to experience the move of the spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. I saw you going into the southwest like maybe New Mexico or somewhere around in that territory. I don't know anybody there, but amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. 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 You know, when we've tasted the ministry of the Spirit, it's hard to settle ever for anything less. I'm thankful that in January 19th, 1963, God baptized me in the Holy Spirit. And I've never been the same, and I've never wanted to be the same. He put something in my heart before then, when I was just a young child, didn't know what to, uh, didn't know how to put it in words, didn't know how to pray, didn't know what it was, but I knew that I was not satisfied with what I had. And when I was just a young child, five years, six years old, You know, we were all Lutherans. My family's all still Lutherans. I'm the only Pentecostal in my family. 
Remember the first time I ever got a word of the Lord, I didn't know there was personal words of the Lord. But the first time I ever received a personal word of the Lord, the word of the Lord in part was that God would use me to be a light to my own people and to my family. And I was uh, interested in being a light to other people, but I wasn't all that much interested in being a light to my own family. And, you know, it's hard getting through to liturgical people sometimes. And, uh, and it wasn't that, that word didn't begin to come to pass overnight. And I wasn't willing to let it come to pass, uh, right away. But looking back now, about 25 years, I can see, and just in the last five, six, seven years, began to see that word of the Lord, uh, come to pass, that God would cause me to be a light in my own family. And He will cause you, uh, to be lights uh, to your households and to your families. We would like it to be a, a glorious ministry and go out here and do signs and wonders somewhere else, but God doesn't make any mistakes. He put you in, in a, a particular household. He put you in a certain family uh, that you would be the one in that place that would show those people the way of the Lord. And I know as well as you do how hard that is, especially if they're not quite of the same persuasion that you are. But uh, as a young child, that was our background, Lutheran, strong Lutheran. But when I was five, I happened to live a block from a Pentecostal church. And when we didn't go to the Lutheran church, my mother sent me to that Pentecostal Sunday school. And I sat there and I didn't know what was going on. They raised their hands. They spoke in tongues. They danced. I mean, that was in the you know 19, late 1940s. I didn't know what was going on. I'd sit there and just like any five-year-old kid, I'd just watch him, you know, go through this and something began to happen within me. There was a hunger that was created within me at that time, five years of age. We moved away from that town. The pastor came to see my family because uh, we were moving. Uh, prayed with my mother to receive Jesus, prayed with my dad to receive Jesus. We knew Jesus. We knew about Him. But we didn't really know Jesus as our Savior. We knew about Him. We believed He was the Son of God. We grew up with that, with that teaching that Jesus is the Son of God. But prayed with my parents. Uh, later on, my father prayed with me to receive Jesus. But we went back into that liturgical setting. And all those years of childhood growing up, I said, Lord, I want to be in that place where I see and can experience the moving of the Spirit again. We lived in a small town, 396 people. Uh, If I wanted to go to church, we went where, you know, the only church in town. And I'd sit there and it would be a long service. But I remember when we... uh, I got out of school and I went to college and the first thing I did was look up that Pentecostal church. I wanted to get back where it felt good and where the services went by quickly. Amen. And I'm thankful. Uh, I'm thankful today uh, for Pentecost. I'm thankful for Pastor. I want to talk this morning about moving into tabernacles. But I'm thankful for everything that Pentecost has been in my life and for what Passover has been in my life. Amen. We can't come to Tabernacles if we don't go through Pentecost. And we can't go experience Pentecost unless we experience Passover. You know, for some of us, uh, this, this is uh, old teaching. And uh, maybe for some of you, it's very elementary teaching this morning. But I am aware of one thing. When we come to camp meeting, there's usually two distinct groups of people. There are those that are are really hungry for God. Then there's some that haven't heard very much, but still hungry for God. Some that have desperate problems in their life and have come for help. You can have desperate problems in your life and still be hungry for God. I want to say that this morning. First time I came to camp meeting, I didn't realize what problems I had. And I was in the ministry. And if you're having a hard time with deliverance, there's nobody that's had a harder time with deliverance than I have. Accepting it. (laughs) Irma would tell you I'd get up and run out of her meetings. (laughs) And I'd say there's only so much that the educated mind can take. (laughs) 
I remember sitting near one camp meeting up here and uh, some brother was up here and he even had a clerical collar on. I remember that and he was ministering deliverance and I'm sitting here and I'm looking at this guy and I thought, you know, you can get people to believe anything. <laughs> and so if you're, if you're one of those that's had a hard time with deliverance, I understand. But I remember that I had some needs that hadn't been met. And I'd prayed about them. I mean, I was pastoring a church when I came down here. And you know, when you're a pastor of a church, you don't tell your people what a wretch you feel like on the inside. What a wretch you are. (laughs) And I came down here and I'm glad that uh, when uh, I prophesied to myself that uh, it's not always right. (laughs) You know, God puts the gifts of the Spirit in, in the church and he puts the gifts of the Spirit within people to edify the body of Christ, not to edify yourself. And, and I found that I don't do too well when I try to give myself a word. <laughs> I miss it by a country mile. <laughs> and I remember the first time I was sitting here in the service, I, I went, I stand back by the door and I was talking to some people from Wisconsin and I says, well, I'll never be back here again. I just moved down here last Tuesday. (laughs) Praise the Lord. But I'm thankful this morning that in spite of all of of, uh, the opposition that I had mentally, I I, I left here after one camp meeting. I was here for a full camp and I was driving up, going to go up to Missouri and visit some friends on my way back to Wisconsin. And I said, Lord, I said, I don't want to kick against the pricks. And through the years, over a span of 25 years, every now and then somebody would come along with with something about deliverance. And I remember when I uh, went to pastor a church and they were brand new Christians. They'd ask me to come and help them get started. And here comes one of the ladies trotting up to me one of the first weeks with pigs in the parlor. And I says, you don't need that book, just put it away. And one night we had a baptismal service. It just was one of those things that happened on the spur of the moment. Six people in our church got baptized in water that night. We weren't planning a baptismal service, but we lived so close to water up there. All, all we had to do was just go out of the door and shine the headlights on the lake and go on out and have our baptism. That's what we did. And all these former Catholics got baptized in water that night. And uh, the ones that I said, you don't need that book, Pigs in the Parlor, they all got baptized, the whole family of them. One week later, I'm getting a phone call, and I hear a, a, a ruckus going on in the background, and, and the, the wife is crying. She says, can you come out right away? And man, I'm thinking, what's going on? I get in the car, I'm speaking in tongues, and I'm running out to their house. And demons had started to manifest. And I was sorry I told them to throw out the book Pigs in the Parlor. Tried to settle them down, but you know, you don't settle down, demons. I mean, you can, but you don't get rid of it. The problem still exists. And so God in his mercy, you know, has brought me along. And I'm thankful this morning for deliverance. I'm thankful for what God has done for me. And I'm thankful that he's not done yet. I'm thankful that I don't have to understand it. That if we just receive... And if we just have a believing heart, I believe God can keep us from getting off on tangents, from getting into false doctrine, from getting into error. If our heart is right, He can keep us. I have confidence in Him that He can keep us. Praise the Lord. I have so enjoyed the services. I I wanted to get back to, I just wanted to say something. I left here. And I said, Lord, I don't want to kick against the pricks. You know, it's hard when you're kicking against something that God has done and is doing. Went up to visit friends that I hadn't seen for a number of years on my way home and I walked in the house and there was problems. He was a pastor in a in a local church. Tremendous problems that, that they were experiencing health problems. And he went to church one night at a board meeting and he and his wife or his wife and I and the children were there alone and we began to pray. I just prayed the day before, Lord, I don't want to kick against the pricks. We began to pray, and you know what happened? Demons began to manifest. You know, and I, I used to think, well, we can, you know, we can explain these things logically. <laughs> we had to cast them out. 
And I'm such a fuss budget, Irma knows. The rest of them on the staff here know, you know. Somebody just looks cross-eyed, ever ready to head for the hills. In the natural, that's the way I am. And uh, uh, demons began to manifest. She began to vomit. And I says, Lord, what have I got myself into here? We just had to keep on praying. Things began to happen. I, God gave me the answer. I said, I don't want to kick against the pricks. I says, Lord, you've got to begin to show me. Even at that, it didn't come easy. But God is so merciful. Praise the Lord. Now, I have, I have so, I enjoy every camp meeting. Every camp meeting is different. Every one, there's a, a, a theme, there's a word that comes through what we're hearing this weekend, and all the speakers has been holiness to the Lord. Every service, we've heard it in one way or another. I enjoyed the meeting last night, brother. It was wonderful. It reminds me of my beginnings. I used to preach that way back when I was five, six years old. I love it. I uh, will never get tired of that kind of preaching. Praise the Lord. I just sat there and I said, Lord, I, I, I've needed this. Man, I was just waiting for him to run the aisles last night. The church I go to up in Upper Michigan, they run the aisles and preach like that too. I love it. And uh, so it's been a wonderful time. And a lot of the things that, that some of us, I want to get back to where I was going to start this morning. A lot of the truth that some of us have heard, and we've heard it for years, a long time. We start talking about the feasts in Israel. We talk about Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. Some of you have cut your teeth on that. And sometimes I'm hesitant to, to begin to share in a, in a group uh, some of these things till I realize it's brand new to a few. A few months ago, I was up ministering in, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I believe I was at a Women's Aglow meeting up in that area. And I was just uh, hitting on some things about Jerusalem and the city of God and Zion and, and just kind of letting it pass and not really uh, going over it uh, maybe as thoroughly as I should. And somebody got me aside afterwards and says, uh, Linda, you don't realize what you're doing. These people don't know what you're talking about. They're worried and they're praying about whether they should redecorate a room and you're talking about Zion and they don't know what Zion is. You've got to explain it to them. And I realize that some of us have been so blessed with such wonderful teaching that we forget that the, the bulk of humanity and of, and of Christianity don't live where we do. I remember when I went to, to begin to uh, pastor, I started going through uh, the feasts, the, uh, the three major feasts in the Old Testament, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. I got to Pentecost, and uh, one of the... Ladies in my church, she had been a church member for 17 years in a Pentecostal church. She says, I didn't know Pentecost was an Old Testament feast. And I says, well, what did you think it was? She says, well, I thought it was that thing that happened in the book of Acts. I says, well, actually, and, and so I began to explain the whole thing. It was brand new to her that there was feast, in the, and I found out that that was not untypical. That so much uh, of what we have been taught has just been uh, centered uh, on, on a few uh, scriptures in the New Testament, and that has been it. But we find in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, and I'm just going to refer to this, and we're, going, we're not going to stop at any one point. Uh, God begins to lay out uh, through Moses, spoke through Moses, about the appointed feast that he has, and he started out with Passover. Fourteenth day of the first month of the sacred year. Because Israel had, had uh, a sacred year and they had a civil year. And so it began with Passover. And our Christian experience uh, always begins with the, with the blood. Uh, it began with the shedding of the blood. It began with the lamb being slain. It began uh, for Israel in the type. These things were types of uh, what God is doing. Uh, what he has done uh, at Calvary, it began, he began back there when he brought Israel out of bondage, out of Egypt, began with the Passover. It spoke of Calvary that was to come down the road. And they put the blood over the doorpost of their house. They ate the Passover. They ate the Passover lamb. They didn't leave any of it. And there are so many types and there are so many things that we can center on and put all of our attention on this morning. I'm just, we're just going to go along very quickly. And all of you who have ever been here before, who have heard me speak, always hear me say this, that we will always start with the blood and the shedding of blood. 
People that try to come into the things of God without coming through the cross, it doesn't work. It becomes a spiritism. If you try to get the baptism of the Spirit without having been to Calvary first, and we've seen this in, in some circles and in charismatic circles, even in Pentecostal circles, where people have wanted to get the baptism of the Spirit without giving their lives to Jesus first and allowing the blood to uh, cleanse them of their sins. And you can have an experience, but I'll tell you what, it won't be a godly experience. It will be a psychic experience, and it will, it will, it will not be a, uh, a work of righteousness. There are people that can speak in tongues and and, and can have visions and can uh, tell you things about yourself who are as unregenerate as a fence post. They can see things. I've had I've had people come to me and it used to bother me. You know, there are people who come to me and would say things and I knew that they weren't really saved. Until God finally uh, began to teach me, you know, as a young Christian, that this was a psychic thing and it was not the Spirit of God. Why do you think that in the Scripture in the New Testament, that when Paul is talking about the gifts of the Spirit, he, we are to sit and we are to judge? That's why Brother Glenn, he hasn't done it in this camp meeting, but why every time he gets up and uh, says, if you're going to prophesy, prophesy here in the service so that we can all judge it. Nobody is beyond having their word judged, and he would say amen to that. Thirty years you've been prophesying, your word still needs to be judged by the body and by the ministry. And that's why we do that. We want to, we want to see God do wonderful things in your life, but we want it to be a pure work. And there would be those that would want to come in from the outside and cause problems. They've got a wrong spirit. And uh, would prophesy out of selfish motives. I mean, we could get into all kinds of things here, but uh, but I, I just want to say again, you don't come to Pentecost till you've been through Passover. And when David experienced the cleansing of the Lord, in Psalm 32, what does he say? Blessed is the man whose sin has been covered. Covered by the blood of Jesus. He covers your sin, He covers my sin, and He sees us righteous. That's the most basic truth of Christianity. That's what makes Christianity different. That's what makes it life. We are the only ones that can say that when our sins are forgiven, they are forgiven. We don't have to do anything else. All we have to do is accept it. We can't do all kinds of good works. We can't do all kinds of things to make ourselves accepted in Him. We are accepted in Him, and our sins are covered only by the blood. Hallelujah. That's Passover. After Passover, after the Feast of Passover, we come to another feast. It was, uh, we had Passover, and then we had unleavened bread, and then we come to this other, uh, the other uh, feast I want to mention, which is Pentecost. Passover, or Pentecost is 50 days, I believe, after unleavened bread. 50 days after um, Pentecost, 50 days after Passover and unleavened bread. Passover and unleavened bread, they're just right together. One celebrated right after the other. And then here comes Pentecost. And when Jesus told his disciples to tarry in Jerusalem, till they be endued with power from on high, they could not hurry that process up. The fullness of time had to come. There are things that God does in our lives. You've just got to wait on it. You can't, in some things, you can't hurry the Lord. There is a timetable. Uh, you have to wait. And I'll tell you, it is hard for me to wait. It's hard for a lot of us to wait. But there's a, a, a waiting time. There is a uh, hibernation time or something, you know, that word growing within you, uh, uh, the ministry growing within you. You feel God's called you to a ministry. There's a time of preparation. There's a time of waiting. And there was a time of waiting uh, for that Pentecostal outpouring. The 50 days had to be accomplished. And there might have been times in that day, that period of time when they were waiting that one of them uh, maybe jumped the gun a little bit and, and wanted to see something move. They didn't. I'm not sure that they really knew what they were waiting for. We know that when they were talking to Jesus just before uh, he ascended, their idea was still very much on a natural level because they said, Are you going to at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said not to be occupied with those things, but to wait. So we knew that their thinking had been along a certain line. So all this time they're waiting. 
And then that day comes. They didn't have to wait any longer. I mean, it was it was now. They didn't have to uh, wonder if something had happened. They knew that they knew that they knew that something had happened. And I want to tell you something. You're going to know when God has met you at Pentecost. You don't have to wonder about it. You don't have to uh, uh, have any kind of thought in your mind at all. Well, did something happen? You'll know when God has met you. Praise the Lord. And I want to tell you something. We don't have to wait. Since the day of Pentecost, we don't, we don't see where there was a... And I don't, I don't mind the fact that we have tarried at times. But really, if we look at things really closely in the light of Scripture, after the day of Pentecost, there was not a tarrying. The fullness of the time had come. When Jesus' uh, was, blood was shed on Calvary, there was no more waiting for that ultimate Passover lamb to be sacrificed. It was done. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, uh, it was done. When the people began to hear the word preached after that initial day of Pentecost, it says they, they received the word and then the Spirit of God fell on them. They had hands laid on them. Some of them needed to hear the word first. They had to hear about it first before they could receive. And some of us... Uh, had teaching that we had to tarry for years. I think you were saying something about somebody that supposedly tarried for years. Uh, sometimes there's things that God needs to do within us, but this idea that you've got to tarry and tarry and tarry and tarry and tarry, I really don't see it in the Scripture. We need to receive gladly what God has done uh, and accept it and let Him do it right now in us. There was a lady that came forward last night to receive the baptism of the Spirit. She didn't have to go away dissatisfied. God met her as she stood here and worshipped the Lord. She began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I love it when, when I see that happen. Oh, Now, when we talk, and we've had teaching here, that uh, we can liken Pentecost, uh, or excuse me, we can liken Passover, to the uh, 30-fold company. We talk about people that bear fruit 30-fold, and, and we've heard it explained that, well, that's Passover, and, and uh, then the 60-fold company is Pentecost, and the 100-fold uh, people that are going to enter into a 100-fold, that's tabernacles. Well, you know, that's a, a good concept. I, there's nothing really wrong with it. We can see, but we do see that God uh, establishes things and we see an order where there is, he works in threes. There's a divi- it's a divine number, uh, these three, er- uh, three things. Uh, we see the, the tabernacle, that there was an outer court, there was an inner court, there was a holy place, the holy of holies. And uh, when the scripture talks about those that bear fruit, there's 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. We see that number three, that divine completion again. But I want to tell you something. Sometimes there are some who have gotten kind of an attitude, well, I don't want to have something to do. I don't want to have anything to do with this because this is a 30-fold realm. You know, that doesn't sit good with me. If you come and you say that to me, you're going to find out that I don't like to hear that. And I'll tell you the reason why is because I have seen people who have supposedly walked in uh, what they consider a hundredfold uh, revelation, acting worse than the people that are back here in the thirtyfold revelation. I've seen people that have been filled with the Spirit who have uh, behaved themselves uh, with less integrity than people who we say, well, they, they're back there in that 30-fold company. I found, and I, and I feel this way, that there are people in, in uh, different realms, if I can use that word, uh, of the Spirit, who are being absolutely obedient to God in the place where they are. And I find as I look at the Scripture as we move on in God, and I think I heard a word on that this morning somewhere, that it's... it's uh, uh, our obedience to the Lord that is going to bring us in to the things that God has purposed for us. It's not our revelation. Amen. It's our obedience. Amen. David said in Psalm chapter 15, he said, uh, Who shall ascend into your holy hill? Who shall dwell in Zion? Him that knows the truth. Who, he who doesn't slander with his tongue. And it goes on, I believe, Brother Trotter, you spoke on a similar uh, scripture the first night. They, you know, this thing isn't difficult. 
But where we're going to end up has to do with how uh, we walk in obedience to the Word uh, and how we walk in obedience to what God has given us right now. Hallelujah. Now, there's something about Pentecost that is very interesting. If you would study in the Old Testament, the Old Testament feast, you know what the, the priest had to do on the day of Pentecost? They had to take two loaves of bread that were made with leaven. And I mean, these weren't little loaves of bread. I mean, they were great big things. Now, leaven in the Scripture is symbolic of evil. And it used to puzzle me, why would the, this bread uh, that is offered to the Lord on the day of Pentecost, why does it have leaven in it, when all the way through the Scripture we see that leaven represents evil? And it was interesting, I, don't, I didn't read this in, in somebody else's uh, uh, literature. One day I was uh, just, if you want to understand, if there's something in the Scripture you don't understand, you know, you really don't need to go to all the commentaries. And you don't have to go to everybody else's writing. You begin to fast and pray and seek God, and He'll begin to unfold it to you. Those those books have a place. But you begin to fast and pray, and I'll tell you, things begin to click after a few days. I've been fasting and praying, and I've been looking at, I've been studying this thing about the feast. And I was just looking in the Scripture, and all of a sudden it all made sense. And I thought, how come I never understood this before? Jesus said he was the bread of life. And at Passover, he covered us with his blood. But when these two loaves of bread made with leaven are waved before the Lord, we see two people. We see, uh, we see Jews. We see the Gentiles, if I can put it that way. We see uh, people uh, that still have imperfection in them. We see people that still have uh, things wrong in their life, but we see them uh, surrounded uh, by Jesus. He has invested himself in their lives, and we see them being offered to the Lord as a wave offering. Even in our imperfection at Pentecost, there's no, Pentecost is not perfection. And we're not going to stay at Pentecost. See, that's the good part. And we have, too many of us, I know I have, we've looked at times, I don't so much anymore, I'm older and wiser and, and uh, realize that we're just not going to find perfection in the Pentecostal realm. And when I was young and, and I'd see somebody get up and begin to move in the Spirit, I'd think, wow, they're holy. I was in Bible school, you know, and, and coming from a, a Lutheran background and then going, you know, practically right into Bible school, I was really in for a shock. And I remember first summer I'm, I'm uh, working, interning in a church, um, you know, during summer vacation from Bible school, I'm interning in a church and there's this lady that would stand and give these most wonderful prophecies and messages in tongues. And one day she came to me and even God had showed her something in a vision and she told me and I thought, wow. And you know, I just kind of wanted to follow her around. And I saw her pitch a fit at her husband one day. And I was absolutely mortified that this wonderful woman of God carried on that way. That was really my first uh, experience in, in seeing somebody who I, I had way up here behave so unseemly. And I'm sure everybody I knew behaved unseemly, but not to that extent. And not only did she pitch a fit, she was superstitious. I couldn't believe it. And as I went on, I found that that wasn't all that untypical. <laughs> But even though there is imperfection in that Pentecostal realm, Jesus identifies with us and we are waved to the Lord. And the scripture says uh, concerning uh, the non-Jews and, or, and, and uh, the Jews, or when Paul is writing in the book of Ephesians, he says that he's taking the two people and he's making them one new man. There's no division anymore. It, and it's no longer... Uh, and, and I look at the promises of God and I don't look at the promises of God as, 
as uh, for natural Israel and, and and for spiritual Israel. I look at the promises of God and I take them and I appropriate them to myself because I'm of the seed of Abraham. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line, right? Amen. It's, it's, it's for me. It's for you. And it was interesting when they'd wave that offering to the Lord, you know. I mean, it, this was a big, a big thing that they were waving to the Lord. It quivered. I think it's interesting that on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God moved, there was a quivering that went on. There were some things that happened. They thought the people were drunk. And here we saw it in a type way back uh, a long time before. It's also interesting that it was the time of Pentecost, I believe, when Moses went up to Sinai and received the law. And we can see all kinds of comparisons, if we would do a comparison this morning, between the giving of the law at Sinai and the, and the receiving of the promise at, at uh, in Jerusalem. And when the law was given at Sinai, 3,000 people were killed because of their disobedience. But at, at uh, Pentecost, in the book of Acts, 3,000 people were made alive. All kind of, we, we could uh, spend a lot of time there this morning, too. I'm thankful that we don't stop at Pentecost. It was interesting at the turn of the century, well, before the turn of the century, back at the time of the, the first Pentecost. The devil would have wanted to snuff that out. And whenever we come to our own personal Pentecost, the devil would want to snuff it out if he could. If he couldn't snuff out the life that you received uh, when you met Jesus at Passover, he'd try to snuff it out at Pentecost. And a lot of times we think, oh, if I could just go back to the way it was when I was first saved. It was so easy then. It was so simple then. But, you know, when we go on, I tell you, it gets better. It, it really does. We don't need to, uh, we, we wish that we would hear the voice of God like we did when we were first saved. Well, he knew what you needed when you were first saved. He knew, he knew we were infants then. We needed, day, uh, we needed guidance, but as we grow up in him, uh, we don't have to ask him guidance for the most mundane and simplest things of life. He's, uh, we know as we walk with him what he expects of us. In fact, it's a religious spirit if you think you've got to go and ask the Lord. Uh, every little minute detail because uh, if you've walked with him for any length of time at all, you know what his will is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a religious spirit that would, uh, would be otherwise. Now, it is at Pentecost and it's at that place at Pentecost where the church was born that God put the ministries within the church. Put the fivefold ministry that Paul writes about. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. Put some ministry gifts that is going to aid in the taking out of the leaven. That is the thing that is going to bring us to perfection. And what is so wonderful about it, and it's so interesting how the Lord does it, He takes imperfect vessels to do a work of perfection in you. And that is what's hard for us to swallow. Somebody comes to us, and they've got the word of the Lord for us, and we've seen their shabby areas. And how can they come and tell me that I've got this need, and uh, or come to me with a prophetic word and say this, when I know that they're no better off than I, than I am? Isn't that the way it is? It's hard to take. Scripture tells us that the treasure is in earthen vessels, that the excellency may be of God and not of man. One of my, I, I have to refer to that every now and then when I get upset with somebody because, you know, we get here in the services. Now, I'm not talking about anybody here at the campground, you know. Uh, I'm talking about people at home uh, where I used to be. <laughs> Thinking about people in my congregation when I was pastoring. <laughs> I can tell I'm digging a big hole here. I better go. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> iron sharpens iron. 
And David said, you know, he said, it wasn't an enemy that reproached me. He said, then I could have bore it. He says, but it was thou, a man my equal. We had sweet fellowship and we walked hand in hand into the house of God in company. It's hard to take it from someone so close to us. You know, we can go out to a convention like this, camp meeting. Someone who doesn't know us can come up and give us a word. And man, we just rejoice and we go home. And your pastor at home or somebody at home could have said the same thing to you and you wouldn't hear it. I was in a church a while back over in Nebraska and the Lord was showing me something about this brother sitting back there and showed me that he was really giving his his wife a hard time. And I thought, well, I'm just here for five days, you know. What do I have to lose, you know? <laughs> so I went back and I began to minister to him and I just laid it all out as the Lord was giving it to me. And his wife, she was just rejoicing. She she just loved it. And I thought the pastor can clean this up after I leave. And, uh, but it was interesting. I was absolutely dumbfounded at the response of this brother. That was the first night. He was there for every service. The pastor told me when we got back to the house after the service to have a time of fellowship, he says, that's. He says, you did the right thing. He says, just just lay it on him. That guy, by the word of the Lord, began to clean up his act. Now, his wife had been telling him the same stuff. But, you know, that that doesn't count. Get somebody who doesn't know you. (laughs) We seem to be able to receive it better. But God, and I want to tell you something. God puts us in local churches. You're not going to have this, this, this work of perfection done in you sitting out on the side of the mountain someplace by yourself. He puts us in local churches. And I want to tell us, uh, tell you, tell myself, tell us, say something else as well. Just because a church does not have the same revelation that you do, and you don't feel that they're moving on and, and all of these things that God has shown to you, you can still receive something by going and sitting in that church if there's not another church to go to. Amen. I don't go with this staying at home because you're not being fed at church. Amen. That is a wrong spirit. That is a religious spirit again that would keep you away from the body of Christ. Amen. You know, we, uh, when we were starting a church in Wisconsin, there had never been a full gospel church that had ever survived in that area. And uh, there was people that, that wouldn't go to church. But I tell you what, you know, you can receive something in a Baptist church. There's something you could, I mean, it, it doesn't hurt you uh, to sit there and, and, and to hear a Baptist sermon if there's nothing else. Amen. I mean, I even go to a Lutheran church once in a while. Amen. I even preach in a few. <laughs> Rod and I had a wedding in one not so long ago. It's a little while now. I mean, we just went in there and acted like Lutherans. <laughs> not really. <laughs> Not really. Rod did, and I did. I still need some deliverance. (laughs) But we have gotten this idea that we have to be, and this is the thing I want to encourage us on this afternoon, this morning. You're going to leave here, and you're going to go back to less than perfect situations. Some of you are going back to towns where you're, you're alone. You might even be in a big city, and you just feel like you are alone. God wants to cause to come to birth in you and to begin to grow forth from you the revelation that he has put within you and and bring others to be joined with you or join you with others in the place where you are, even if it's two or three. You know, we've heard lots of teaching about coming out of Babylon, coming into the wilderness, going into Canaan. But I realize something, that some of us, And some who have had this revelation are always going around all the time looking. And and maybe God has called you to be a Joshua and a Caleb, you know. But are going around looking all the time. And I shouldn't say it's a complete waste of time, but I think we might be missing it sometimes. Go around looking for other Joshuas and Calebs to fellowship with. When God wants you in your place uh, as a Joshua or as a Caleb to bring a people in in that place. I'm glad you can receive that this morning. Now, we've been at Pentecost. 
few weeks ago, I heard the Lord speak to me. I mean, really speak to me. I was on my way to a convention, uh, just wanted to observe down in Chicago, and a friend and I were traveling together from northern Wisconsin, driving along in a car and just talking about the things of God. All of a sudden, I heard in my spirit the Lord begin to say something. And he told me that I had to change my thinking. And I had to open my eyes to behold what he was doing. Now, I grew up in little churches, even as Lutherans. I mean, uh, there's places in the South where you can go within 10 miles and you'll find 10 Pentecostal churches. And you can, or uh, other places, you can go within 10 miles, find 10 Baptist churches. Uh, there are certain places up north that used to be you'd go 10 miles and find 10 Lutheran churches. You know, all a little bit different. And, and that was our background. We had these little churches. You'd have a few families that were Norwegian Lutherans. You had the Danish Lutherans over here. You had the German Lutherans over here. And then you had another sect of, of Norwegian Lutherans that didn't want to be identified with those, so they were Hauge Lutherans. And they were more holy than the ones... You know, it, it's the same in every denomination. It, there's not much difference. Uh, that spirit just keeps on going right along with you. I forgot what I was going to say. I got so carried away in all the... the Lord's oh, the Lord... And, and so I had that, uh, had that mentality. Uh, always had been in these small churches. And when God called me to the ministry, I wanted, I, I wasn't interested in the big churches. I said, Lord, I want to go uh, where the other ministries don't go. And man, he took me at my word. I've been way up in the places where nobody goes. <laughs> I tell you, I was up in one church a while back, and I thought, well, there'd probably be about eight or nine people here. I mean, it was at the end of the road, sticking up in Lake Superior, way up there. They get 400 inches of snow a year in that place. I thought, oh, eight or nine people. I walked through the door. The place was packed. I thought, I can't believe this. You know, God was moving by his spirit in this place. And so anyway, my, but my mind has always been geared towards the small. And, and these little places, I said, I want to be a blessing where there hasn't been a breath of fresh air and, and, and moved along like this. And I've always prayed, Lord, show me your remnant in this place. Had this, this, and I believe that God's always had a people. He's always had a remnant. God moves by a spirit in a place. It's not just an indiscriminate move. There's been somebody that's been there and prayed whether you know it or not. Somebody who has lived there who has prayed for that area or someone who's been somewhere else who zeroed in by the, by the leading of the Spirit and has prayed for that area. I had some friends, an elderly couple, uh, after they got the baptism of the Spirit in 1968, they were Lutherans. Uh, the ministry God put on this precious husband and wife uh, was that they would pray. They would take the globe. And they'd put it on the table and they would go as the Spirit of God directed them and pray for places I'd never heard of. And God would show him things about those countries as they prayed. They're both in heaven now. I believe they've got a wonderful reward from God for their faithfulness uh, in, in the way that they interceded for those areas. They used to pray. He told me, he says, we pray for Russia. He says, you know, I don't feel any blockage. He put his hand like, he says, I don't feel any blockage when I pray for Russia. He said, it's wide open. It was wide open. He'd seen it in the spirit. And so I'd always ask God, well, show me your remnant. And I want to tell you something, the most wonderful thing that I personally experienced as I have traveled in the ministry uh, over the years is that God has given me the wonderful, wonderful privilege of seeing his remnant people all over the world. People tucked away. I've loved it. I've been so blessed by that. But God spoke to me in the car that day and he said he wanted me, I, I had to begin to change my thinking because the remnant people are the, the ones that have been faithful to God, I have the, are the ones that are praying for what we, we are coming into. Some don't know what to call it. They don't, not everybody calls it tabernacles uh, that we're coming to. The ingathering, the time of the ingathering. But this is the place we are coming to right now in history. Is a time of ingathering. I believe this. We're not staying at Pentecost. We are coming to Tabernacles. I, both, I personally feel that we are at the time right now where the trumpets are being blown. 
There have been trumpets that have been blown throughout history. There have been the sounding forth of the trumpet. I believe the trumpet is a prophetic word. And I believe we have been hearing a prophetic word. Charisma Magazine recently I had an article about the restoration of the prophetic word. I didn't totally agree with everything that was said in the article. But we're finding an increase in uh, uh, people uh, wanting to know more about the prophetic word. And when I talk about the prophetic word, I'm not talking about some of the simple prophecy that we have heard. Uh, and and I, I mean, I, I like prophecy and, and I'm not talking about someone telling you, you know, uh, what happened to you yesterday by a word of knowledge or something like that. But I'm talking about that strong prophetic word that is calling God's people uh, to come and humble themselves before God, to get right with God, uh, to purge out the old leaven, uh, to get us in that place where we will be ready for Him when He comes. That we will be a people, a bride who has made herself ready. And that, there has been that call, there has been that sound in the Spirit calling God's people back to repentance, calling God's people back to this place. That, I believe that that is at that place where we are at. And I believe that, uh, that, that, uh, sounding of the trumpets, that, uh, sounding of, of the word is going to grow stronger in the days to come. That's my, my feeling on the matter. <laughs> But we are coming to the time of ingathering, coming to the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now we've seen a lot of stuff that wasn't God at Pentecost. Seen the leaven in Pentecost. We've seen things at the other stages in our walk with God. But Tabernacles is what our hearts are crying out for. We long for that perfection of God. There is a cry in my heart. Uh, this morning for God's perfect work to be done in me. There is a cry in my heart for God's work to be accomplished in you, uh, for, for it to become, for it to be completed. We see that this is His ultimate purpose, is that He will have a perfect people, uh, that will live on this earth and will show His glory and radiate His glory. He is going to be revealed in His people on this earth. Yes. Hallelujah. He will have a people. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're at that place and I am excited. And God spoke. He said, you've got to begin to open your eyes to see what I am doing in this end time. That I am bringing and ingathering. I, I mean, it's a time of ingathering. This is what he spoke to my heart as I was going along in the car. I haven't been quite the same since. And there are those that God has had tucked away who have been faithful to pray. And God has come for their prayers. God has come for their prayers. I don't want to fight what God is doing right now. There are things... I went on to that conference and I wanted to hear, you know, what the Spirit of God was saying there. And, and there was... As far as I was concerned, it was a good word. I didn't see anything that was out of line with the word. There was other things that I didn't particularly uh, care for. It wasn't my style. The music wasn't quite my style. And it wasn't rock. It wasn't anything like that. But it was just, it, it didn't have that kind of beat that I'm accustomed to. Well, God speaks to me. And I don't want to put my hand to something just because it's a little bit different than what I'm accustomed to. And this is the way we have been in the middle court. This is the way we've been in, in the Pentecostal realm. If something hasn't been just quite like we have experienced it, I believe I heard somebody talk on this too. We're not so sure that it's right. i tell you what we have to look for is that holy life of Jesus Christ coming forth in that individual. Is that holiness being expressed in that body of believers? Is Jesus Christ being manifest? I want you to stand with me this morning. I want us to pray that prayer. Oh, Jesus, be revealed in me. Oh, we lay aside, amen, the works of darkness this morning, the things that have beset, the things that have stood in the way. God, bring us on beyond Pentecost this morning. Oh, Father, I may the cry of each one of our hearts be to come in the tabernacles. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Some of you 
come from local churches that has a good strong word being preached and are being established, but there are some of you today, you come and you're very much alone in the community where you are. And I'd like to do something. I'd like you to come forward this morning. I'd like the ministry just to bless you as you go back to the place uh, where you are and that you will be a Joshua or a Caleb in that place. That you will be one that will sound the word in that place and uh, uh, be a light. I, I want us to sing it again. And if you're one of those, we want you to come here. We're going to bless you this morning and, pass, and uh, uh, lay on hands and encourage you in that place where you are. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Brother Rod, Brother Trotter, Sister Irma. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you. Thank you.